It finally started raining here, so I took my son, who's 14 years old, out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go, and the sun goes down much earlier, but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes of finding turkey tails or chanterelles. We took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which would eventually take us back around to the main trail near the river. As we walked towards the main trail, the last group of people had left and it was just me and my son. We walked along, and out of a thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us, this really weird, slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but didn't want to be impolite, so I half-heartedly waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After nearly a full minute of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned around and began walking down the trail towards the main trail. I was wary walking down, didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants. So the guy and dog got further down this trail, which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting right around the corner. And sure enough, he was standing at the junction, standing slightly off to the left, in between my son, myself, and the parking lot, while to the right was a .6 trail to the river. Dude was just standing there, with his dog, staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were eerily taken aback by this. We decided that we'd keep wide to the right and saying, he looks old, so we can probably run faster than him, and just generally planning for the worst case scenario, you know, just in case. He kept staring at us as we approached. I asked if he was okay, as I kept my stare right back at him. He was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts, probably about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix, and he didn't answer me at all just kept staring. We turned to the right and walk about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder, and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling his stare, but what made it more so was his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses, and his slow zombie wave at us was the cherry on top of this situation. He did end up leaving, because on our way back, he was no longer standing on the main trail, which was a relief to both my son and I. But as we make it back to the parking lot, and just about get into the car, my son's gaze finds the only other car in the parking lot at this point, a blue pickup truck, and I'll give you one guess as to who was in the driver's seat. We didn't sit around to parse through more of the details, and as we hightailed it out of there, we had to drive right by the truck to hit the exit. And the entire time we drove, this man's gaze followed us. And while his truck didn't move an inch, while he didn't exit like we did, his stare was enough to give me the chills the entire way home. It just leaves me wondering, what did he want? brief setting and context before I get into this story. I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents, so I'm staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment, and this story unfolded just about an hour ago. The window in my room faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night, since I need it to be cool to sleep and I haven't really had to worry about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, and I can reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises, and will stand her ground, bark, 
and growl if she senses a threat. So again, I've never really worried about that open window. After tonight, though, I won't be able to not worry about it. It started at maybe 3.30, 4 a.m. sometime. I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns, and I'm awake at odd hours. I was reading a book and heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking at the window before jumping up at the cabinet by the window barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police. My dog will bite, just in case there was someone there. I went to look out the curtains to the side, but I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over covering the right side curtain too, tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then. It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear and occasionally someone passing by or the neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark. But she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She'll usually growl, but stay on the bed. And her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the window to potentially burgle, they'd seen now that the room was occupied by a person and a dog and would go find an easier target. But mainly... I guessed it was just a random noise she'd heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later, after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off soon. But I heard her growl again. A really serious, deep, and low growl. And I listened again, thinking it might be foxes or something. But I heard what sounded like deep, horror movie breathing noises. Like the heavy breathing sounds a pervert makes down the phone to his stalking victim in a film. I sat up, looked up at the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone was peering under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted, hey, again, and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right, towards the front door, and then exit out of the front garden. Too dark to make out features or clothing. It was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and was it at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone, and called for emergency services. One thing that creeps me out in hindsight is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted, and he knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. It was so loud, like someone was trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure, and it was. Very careful to lock doors, and all other windows at night, and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5 a.m. and took the report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow. And they went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5 a.m. Since the dark men I only saw the shape of a person, no real description, I doubt that they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think of a man. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and his height would have had to be between 5'10 and 6'1. I'm still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. I'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like this would happen. I don't have any enemies no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges. Since I'm caring for my folks full-time now, I'm not out socializing or making any enemies. Nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I'm on the wrong side of 35, living in jeans or joggers and t-shirts, no makeup or fussing with hair most of the time, 
so not a likely target for a peeping Tom pervert. If it wasn't my dog who alerted me to something both times, I'd wonder whether I was half asleep and dreamt it, that I'd maybe imagined it. I've had hallucinations once as a result of a bad reaction to a medicine, but that was more than a decade ago and hasn't happened before or since. And I learned how to test my reality in times I was worried about whether something really happened or not from a psychologist when I asked how I could ever trust my own senses again after that reaction to the meds. They said that to be sure something was real, to see if other people can see or hear the thing too, or if it's a noise or voice outside, can I see someone or something that explains the noise? If so, it's not likely to be a hallucination if it's both aural and visual perceptions match up. The dog sent someone there first, and then I heard and saw someone. I wasn't dreaming or imagining it. I don't use drugs and almost never drink. I'm scientifically minded and don't believe in ghosts. And while I love a good horror film, I'm rarely freaked out by them anymore. I guess I'm too old and cynical. I have to think it was someone who was looking to burgle a house. But for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode. Or, and this one bothers me most, someone who wanted to scare me. But why? Who? They know where we live. Are they going to keep coming back? New fears keep popping into my mind. Like most nights, I'm up at some point late or in the very early hours and will let the dog outside in the garden for a quick pee. And then I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to attack and gain entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back garden with only a small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access, then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep by then. They seemed to be trying to deliberately scare me when they returned the second time, doing that deep breathing noise and staying by the window even after I'd shouted. In those few seconds it would have taken for me shouting out, until I reached the window and could move the curtains to see out, they could have moved and been long out of sight, but they'd stayed there until there was a chance I could see them, only then moving away. The breathing noises, and then the coldness that ran through me when I actually saw a man moving away from the window will haunt me forever, along with the question of their motives. Were they trying to scare me? Why? And what's to stop them? from coming back. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my very first apartment. It was a small bachelorette apartment in a sketchy area. I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough, so I knew how to handle myself and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not to go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar. A lot of customers of the bar would stand outside to smoke. When they stood outside to smoke, they would be looking at my apartment. Most of the people who were out smoking kept to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I passed by, but never any issues. Until one evening. One night I came home from work. I passed the bar and saw this extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed, he stared at me. I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me at all. He just continued to stare blankly. While it made me uncomfortable in the moment, I didn't think much of it. About an hour later, I'm comfortable in my room when I hear a knock on my door. It was odd, because you have to buzz people into the building. The building only had eight apartments, and I didn't really know any of my neighbors, so I couldn't imagine who would be knocking. I froze because I really didn't want to talk to anyone either, but the knocking continued, more feverish and louder. I finally shouted, who is it? Who's there? And the voice said, it's Tom. I didn't know anyone named Tom, so I shouted back, I don't know anyone by that name. You must have the wrong apartment. The voice said, you may not know me, but I know you open up so we can talk. 
I went over to the peephole, and it was the same tall dude from the bar. I loudly said, F*** off, or I'm calling the cops. I heard his footsteps walk away, and heard the building door open, and then close once more. He was gone, at least for the moment. A few minutes later, I peeked out the window, and he was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be talking to himself, and at this point, I'm rightly freaking out. I called my landlord, who lived in the building next to me. He told me to call the police, and that in the meantime, he and his brother would come check things out. I call the police and tell them what's going on. They said that a car is on the way. Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother make their way out to the parking lot. I watch out my window and see them approach Tall Dude. Tall Dude takes one glance at them and then bolts. My landlord and his brother try to chase him, but he got away. About five minutes later, the police arrive. I give my version of events and also a description of the man. The officer at that point puts his pen back into his pad, stares back at me, and says, We've had reports of a man matching that description who's been assaulting women. Thank God you didn't open the door. A few days later, I get a call from the officer. He told me part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar and letting him know the situation. The owner called the police when Tall Dude reappeared after a few days, and the police promptly responded and arrested him. By all accounts, this was the same man accused of all those other assaults. And as if to reiterate something that I'm sure doesn't need any saying, thank God I didn't open my door that night. So this story is a few years old, but whenever I tell it to people, the reaction is always some variation of, holy f***. At the time of this story, it's mid-October, I'm 20 years old, and a senior in college. I got out of class at about 9pm, and headed downtown in my college town to see about an open mic thing that was supposed to be happening at a hookah lounge. And around that time there was a guy who would play accordion on one of the corners of the main thoroughfare. Didn't find accordion guy, and either the hookah place was closed, or it wasn't an open mic night. I don't quite remember. But as I'm walking back down one of the main streets that heads back onto campus, I came across this very drunk woman begging two other women for a ride home. I think the girls were getting into an Uber, or they didn't have space in their car, or something along those lines. Point is, the other women weren't taking her, and couldn't, or wouldn't, help her. Mind you, this is a Thursday night at around 9pm. When she finds that the other women can't help her, and I'm walking past, she turns to me instead, asking for my help in getting home. For context, I still have my backpack on, my phone's running low, and I've been at this school and in this town for three years, so I know downtown and campus pretty damn well on foot. I'm a young, average female, and also of note, I don't have a car at this time. She gives me an address, and it's maybe a 15 to 20 minute walk north, slightly northeast from where we're at. And I knew the general area of where it was, so I was more than happy to be a good Samaritan and walk a drunk woman home who didn't feel safe. Boy, do I regret my bleeding heart after this. She's incredibly thankful and overjoyed that someone is willing to help her get home. The route we were going to take was super straightforward, and I knew exactly where I was in relation to the rest of the town. She says that she has to pee really badly. I reassure her that it won't be long and she'll be back at her place soon. She says that she was out with her boyfriend, and he left her at the bar alone, drunk, and mad at her or something. She says she's from out of state. I commiserate with her that what he did was shitty. She asked me about what I'm studying. I confided that I was finishing a bachelor's of science in information technology. She starts in about her experience with the dark net. She's bemoaning this boyfriend that's at home that I'm walking her back to. She keeps trying to walk with me like up against my side or slightly behind me and I'm like no, walk slightly ahead of me or keep some space. She has a dermal piercing on her cheekbone that's hard to miss. She's getting more and more manic and weird as we walk along. We get about half a mile into north downtown, less than a mile from the address she gave me and the boyfriend's calling her 
and being a real douche nozzle. I'm about done with this guy from the sh she's telling me about this, that, and the other thing. So she puts him on speakerphone, and I tell him that he needs to chill out. We're on such and such road, close by. His tone changes in an instant. He goes from hostile and angry to surprisingly chill. I may be neurodivergent, but that threw up a million more red flags for me. And she starts saying that I'm going to have a good time at their house. I'm looking for an exit here. Every bone in my body is screaming at me to get out of this situation. We get to the end of this road, which coincides with an intersection that has a gas station. I say, hey, let's stop here to use the bathroom. She says that she doesn't have to use the bathroom anymore. I'm scared shitless at this point. I tell her, well, maybe you don't have to, but I do, which was true. We go into the gas station. I head immediately to the bathroom and text one of my friends asking if she was working and if she could pick me up or if I needed to call the campus safe ride home program. Friend says it'll be a minute if I'm willing to wait. So I agree. I come out of the bathroom and this drunk woman, if she was even actually drunk to begin with, has vanished. Nowhere in the store, nowhere outside that I care to look. I buy a soda and wait for my friend and her friends to come save me. After about 20 minutes, my safe ride refuge arrives. I have a lot of friends that are opinionated and I can't always tell what's true when they tell it to me. But I'm later told that facial dermal piercings like hers are sometimes affiliated with human trafficking. And to be honest, with the vibes and the changes in tone and the narrative that was being spun around me walking this woman home, and how she just completely vanished on me when I got to a safe place with lights and cameras and such. I have to wonder if that wasn't the plan. I won't ever know for certain, but it definitely scared the ever-loving daylights out of me as a 20-year-old. After the ride back to campus with my friends, they take me to one of their dorm rooms and I spend more of the evening with them, just so I wouldn't be alone. Forever thankful for three underclassmen for rescuing me from a gas station at 10 p.m., while I'd love to say that I never ran into the antagonist from the story ever again, that would be a lie. A few months after this happened, I was out at a drag bar getting crossfaded with friends, and I recognized her at a table near ours. I was completely panicked for the rest of the night, terrified of this woman and what could have happened before and then. While she never approached me or our table that night, it transported me back to a few months previous thinking about just how thankful I am for listening to my gut and my weak bladder that got me out of that situation. When I was like six years old, I attended the elementary school, which was located in our small town. My way to and from school was basically just about a thousand feet of main road before turning onto the street where I lived. At the time, we're talking about the late 90s here. All the parents in town were extremely adamant on telling their kids not to trust or follow strangers. Never get into anyone's car, even if they say they know your parents and are friends. The reason why, there was a murder like three years back in the same town. A girl not even six years old was found dead in a field. The strange thing about it was that nobody knew exactly how she was taken. No signs of forced entry or anything at the home, and no accounts of her being snatched off the street, which implies that somebody lured her somewhere without her suspecting a thing. The case still hasn't been solved more than 20 years later. So our parents were very afraid that their kid was gonna be next, because kids can be really stupid, and you just can't watch them 24 seven. Now on to what almost happened to me. I was walking home from elementary school, about halfway home, I entered the shadiest and most covered area of my walk. A car pulled up next to me. A blonde, about 30-ish woman was the driver. She told me she could drive me home. She claimed to be going in that direction anyway, which was unclear to me at the time, but essentially bullshit. because once the road ends near my house, there's nothing but empty fields. Being very kid-like, and not as aware of the situation as I am now. I wasn't suspicious. I just said, oh no, it's not that far. I can walk. Then she started being more insistent. The whole, oh come on, it's fine. 
nothing to worry about, and you can relax instead of walking. The alarm bells only started ringing when she said she knew my mother. They are friends, and supposedly she was asked by her to drive me home. Thank God for my parents repeatedly talking about the tricks that people use to lure you in. I started to be creeped out, continued to walk, but she kept driving right beside me. Now the real weird part in hindsight was her next attempt to get me into the car. She started saying that I was obviously afraid, and cool children are not afraid of such things. If you want to be cool, you should just relax. Honestly, I didn't fully realize the full extent of the situation. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of the conversation. So I started sprinting the rest of the way back to my house. Once I got home, I stood between our front door and the living room window, occasionally peeking out for what felt like an hour. And guess who drove by and basically checked out the house? Of course, that creepy woman. The road was a dead end road and she opted to drive by the house three or four times before eventually pulling off to not come back. It took years until I realized what kind of bullet I dodged there. All I was thinking was, my parents told me not to do this. I didn't know why or what that woman wanted. The drill of hearing over and over again not to believe strangers or get into their car kicked in. When I got older and started getting into true crime, I remembered this whole thing for the first time in two decades. Then I realized, holy sh**, that woman was most likely sent as the trustworthy front woman to lure kids into their car and then take off. Could be she was doing this for some crazed pedo or maybe even human traffickers. The moral of the story, even if your kids are too young, like I was, to comprehend such things, the rules of not following strangers and the fact that strangers will lie to you for evil intentions must be drilled into your child's head, like saying please and thank you, or looking both ways before crossing a road. A couple years back, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made darn good money delivering. I had worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in a much safer area for this very reason. I got luckier than I could have ever imagined. One night, I was working and had a double, that's two deliveries, to take out. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank, which is what drivers are given to use to make change for cash orders. That way you don't have to have a ton of cash on you all at one time. The first order went smoothly. The guy gave me a 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still pretty light out. The chain I worked at had us drive company cars with a logo on it, all white sedans. That's gonna be an important detail. I grab the order and go to the door to the apartment building. A young guy comes out, and a much bigger, older guy was outside smoking a cigarette at the same time. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy exited. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around made me very nervous. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount, and he said that that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something felt very wrong. I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door as the first guy looked around down the parking lot craning his neck as if he was looking for somebody. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm. Then the first guy held a gun to my right temple. I also felt a poke in my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form, no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and your keys. Now. The first guy growled, and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him my bank, but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in. I gave him the keys, trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from my left. He had poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. 
the one behind me, I hadn't seen yet. The big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag, ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car. Luckily I had left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone. That's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my five-year-old son, who is absolutely my world. Please, please, don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. That was a lie. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. A car began pulling in, and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun in front of me. Standard issue 9mm, silver and black. Safety off. It looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran off with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her child. Panic set in as I realized they could easily come back and do way worse to me as the sky began to darken. I collapsed. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to 911 as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assume, helped me make the call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. While I'm colorblind, it was obvious that these men were wearing all black and white clothes. I had a full description of two of them. The poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work, but she still stayed until I was off the phone and cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, but I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriends. Cops showed up and contacted my store, and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried coworkers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork, and the $72 was written off as a loss by the store. Thank goodness, because I had worked at other stores that make you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug. He was to this day one of the best bosses I've ever had. What I didn't know was I was in for a very long night. Before I left the store, I used the store phone to call my best friend and ask where he was. We usually meet up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at the bar. So I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me his dad had given him a heads up, and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him. He said yeah, and handed the phone right over to me. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him I'd had two shots, so he sent out a squad car to get me, since it wasn't that far. We get to the station. They had suspects in custody, and I was needed to ID them. Three boys and a driver. They had been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery, speeding. The bolo had already gone out, and they matched the description. They had used the money to buy weed and gas, and had tried to take off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone. My phone was found in the mix. The police told me to grab my phone only, and I did. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset. It unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again. Although my parental instincts had kicked in, I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show him mercy. He was the one with the white shirt on. The police went wide-eyed and told me he was the one talking. The other three denied any involvement. That's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. 
We found out later he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy despite having the gun to my back was because I asked them to go easy on him. He seemed like he was a good kid and he didn't want to be there the same way that I didn't want to. Plus he was the only one confessing. Makes sense since even he had said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught. But the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, well, it was his 18th birthday. He got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he made fun of me and was laughing the whole time. Seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like grin. All I saw was pure evil. This kid will commit more crimes. I have no doubt he will eventually end someone's life. And you can see how cold he is by just looking in his eyes. He seems evil incarnate. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers. I had never seen this kind of evil in my life, and I never want to see it again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out. I'm very glad that I did because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court only had my old address, which was my parents' house, and my mom didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years. It's only been four. He's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior, overcrowding. I'll say this, I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know, knows his face and name. If he tries anything, we're all ready. But for his sake, let's not meet. To the woman and her family who helped me, if you see this, please know my undying gratitude for you all. It was inconvenient for you. You were late for work, yet you still took the time to help me, and I can't thank you enough. I bought Christmas presents for your daughter. But when I went back to the apartment and found the landlord, he said that you had moved. I didn't want to be a creep and ask the address for your new place, but I'm glad you got out of that bad neighborhood and I hope your beautiful baby girl is doing well too. I would gladly meet you again to give you the proper thanks you deserve, but for now, I hope these thanks will suffice. Sincerely, the Domino's Driver from Southwest Ohio. A friend of mine recommended that I should share this story. What I'm about to describe will sound like a cheap cliche movie script, but this did indeed happen. Even at home, barely anybody believes me without confirmation from other parties involved. So buckle up, it's a long haul. Autumn 2019, I'm in British Columbia, Canada. I'm originally from Germany, but spent half a year in Canada as part of my bachelor's degree. I barely got back before COVID hit. I was 22 years old at the time, and the other people involved were about the same age. Another foreign student and I befriended this local Canadian student. We all had the same interests and humor, and the dude became a very good friend of ours. He told us all about the local area, and we spent a week in the summer with him and his father at their very remote, remember this fact, cabin near some woods. They taught us how to handle guns there, and even let us shoot a lot. Then fall came and we had a lot of free time due to being finished with all our papers and such. So our buddy proposes that we go and spend a few days at his dad's cabin, this time without his father there. We said yeah, because we could load up on booze and weed and have a great time for sure, just living the life. Three close dudes in the woods, gaming and getting wasted. Sounds great, right? After loading up on all the supplies, the first three days were pretty calm. On the first day, just like the last time we were there, I barely slept and was generally tense. This is because I'm naturally a very paranoid guy, and I often go into alert mode in situations which is often mocked by my friends. In this case, what freaked me out was the fact that we were far, far away from civilization. And you never understand just how quiet your surroundings can be until you spend some time in a remote area like this. 
which led me to often just standing in the dark at night, listening to the surroundings of the cabin. But after the first few days, I got less paranoid. After all, I was with friends, was constantly high, and we were quite armed and dangerous. Probably the most dangerous to ourselves, though. Day four came. We spent the day attempting to hunt in the woods, but mostly just chilling under trees with a beer and rifle in hand. But in the evening, it began to rain heavily. After an hour, we were starting to see lightning in the distance. With quite a bit of time passing between lightning and thunder, which meant the thunderstorm itself was still some time away. So we called it quits on our incompetent hunting attempts and started trekking back towards the cabin. It took us about an hour to reach it, due to the fact that it was very dark out already and the rain had created unsafe footing. For context, you should know that once you've spent a few days in the wilderness and haven't seen a soul other than your friends, you can become quite careless about your surroundings. I think you can imagine why I'm telling you that last part. So we enter the cabin. At that time, the thunderstorm was raging full on. We put away our gear and changed clothes, except for our guns. Yeah, I know drugs and guns are a horrible combination, and I wouldn't mix that shit nowadays. But we were drilled quite well by Canadian friend's dad regarding trigger discipline, safety, etc. And man, I really miss spooning my rifle while sleeping. We cozied down in the living room at a table, started a YouTube video, and began playing cards. Barely 20 minutes had passed since we returned. And at the time, we didn't bother closing the curtains in the living room because thunderstorms are baller as hell. So imagine that we were three guys, sitting around a table, occasionally in awe at the weather outside, while playing cards. In such a remote place, it's extremely dark outside. Without a full moon and clear skies, it's basically pitch black. The only lamps we have are old-ass vintage-looking and dimmer than my phone screen. What comes next is how my also non-local friend has described what he saw. While sipping from his beer, another lightning went off. He spit it out instantly after the lightning came and screamed loudly and stood up. No words, just the sound of sheer panic. My Canadian friend and I were instantly perplexed and looked at him. There's somebody outside. He started rambling about how in that split second the lightning illuminated the outside of the cabin. He saw a person standing a bit of a distance away, looking directly at us. My non-local friend is obviously in full-on panic. His face is filled with anxiety. This communicated to our Canadian buddy and me that this guy wasn't just messing around with us. He did see somebody outside. I grabbed my rifle and pulled the bolt to rack around into the chamber. I feel that warm sensation running down my spine of my body releasing adrenaline. I tried staying far away from that window, peering my best in the darkness outside, but I couldn't see anything. While our Canadian friend rushed into his room to grab his pistol, I start panicking even more because I realize we didn't lock the door. Why would we? We haven't seen anyone in days and are in the middle of nowhere, but I still run to the door and lock it. Our friend returns with his pistol, which he grabbed because there was a flashlight attached to it. He carefully approached the window, then changed his pace from sneaky to fast and pushed the window open with one hand while the other hand was aiming the handgun outside. I wish I was any good at drawing, because what we saw next when our friend turned on the flashlight was the most terrifying image I've ever seen. It's burned into my mind. The fact that I cannot share the image with other people has been bugging me for three years now. The light turns on, and what we saw in that moment was a man, tall and slim, dressed in all black, with a hooded raincoat, which he had pulled over his head covering pretty much all of his features, except for his eyes. But not far away from the cabin, just a few steps away from the window. Not standing as our friend had yelled earlier, but crouching, looking directly at us with clenched eyes and a terrifying little smirk to one side of his mouth. Another lightning flashes, and for that moment, we were all frozen. What we saw must have shocked the other guys as much as it did me, because nobody said anything for a few seconds. There's a hard to explain dreadful feeling about seeing something like this. In a storm, in the middle of nowhere, a person dressed in a black raincoat, 
suddenly crouching so close to you and peering directly into your soul. Our Canadian buddy was aiming his pistol and flashlight at the also frozen crouch smirking man and yelled out with a slight stutter and a higher pitched voice than I've ever heard from him. Get, get, get the f away from us or we'll shoot. I guess at that moment after his eyes had adjusted, the raincoat man realized that this was not just a flashlight, but a gun. Raincoat man's slight smirk changed to something where I'm unsure if it was shock or rage. All this had happened in less than a minute. While my friend kept on yelling, the raincoat figure turned by about 90 degrees towards the nearest tree line and went from crouched to full on sprint. He ran away to the right side of our window. Two of us poked our heads out of the window to see where exactly he was heading, but with the heavy rainfall and darkness, we could barely make out anything in the distance of that tree line. After a few minutes of just looking at each other in disbelief, we decided to pop off a few rounds outside the window to prove that we were for real in our threat and to cope with the situation in whole. When the shock wore off, we decided to call the police. They asked a lot of questions on the phone to describe the location of the cabin and a description of the man who just almost crept up on us, totally unsuspecting and only revealed due to lightning and luck. Due to us being in such a remote area, the cops told us that it would take at least one to two hours for somebody to come out. They asked because of the weather and time if it'd be all right if they send somebody out in the morning to talk to us and get all the details. Given how the man saw that we were armed, he probably wouldn't come back again. We agreed to the police coming out later, and we discussed just jumping in the truck and leaving right then, but that would have meant refueling the truck. And the idea of doing this now, in the dark and in that heavy rain, was simply too frightening to muster. I kept thinking about this guy lurking in the darkness and attempting to pick us off one by one. We spend the night sleeping in shifts. One person was awake and standing guard. The others at least attempted to sleep. When my turn came, the rain had died down. I turned off all the lights, opened a window, and just sat there in the darkness, trying to listen for any sound that I could hear and looking out the windows to scan the area. Let me tell you, when you're sitting in the dark for hours in full alert mode, just trying to sit still, listen and look around, you have a lot of time to think and reevaluate what had just happened. Close to the middle of the next day, Two cops arrived. We had to give them a detailed report of what happened, when it happened, and to show them in which direction the raincoat shade ran off to. They said they would organize for a patrol to comb through the woods, but that might take a while because they needed experienced outdoorsmen. Sadly, we didn't see many details of the man's face. We couldn't tell if he was young or old, only that he was tall and clean-shaven. The chances of finding exactly who that was and find out what the hell he was attempting to do were very slim. Though one of the officers expressed that this whole happening was deeply worrying. We left the cabin a few hours later, after the police had left, and Canadian guy's dad insisted we stay at his place at least for a day, not just for the safety, but also because he wanted to hear every last detail from that night. We heard later that the dad and his brother went back to the cabin and just sat there in the dark waiting for Raincoat Man to return. But I never heard any of the results, so I guess he must have gone hunting in another area. I also never heard from the cops again. Next January, I left Canada and returned home. My Canadian friend was called in for an interview a few months later, and it seemed like the police were still seriously investigating this, looking for the guy who crept up on a cabin during a thunderstorm. The image of that crouched raincoat figure, completely wet and surrounded by darkness, so close to our cabin, is literally burned into my brain. I will most likely never forget this. I still sometimes turn off all the lights and just look out the windows in silence, trying to listen for sounds, even though I'm now on the other side of the world. We have speculated a lot about what that guy was. The winning theory is that this guy most certainly had sinister intentions. This didn't look like just an attempt at burglary. Remember, we had dim lights on, you could see that there was somebody inside the cabin. When my friend had yelled out that he saw somebody, the guy went from walking and standing to crouching as he got closer to the window. I suspect the raincoat man wanted to check what kind of victim was on his menu. 
and I don't want to imagine what he had in store if he had found some less prepared individuals in that cabin. We didn't see any headlights pass by during the night. The guy also had no backpack or anything, just the raincoat and black weather-appropriate clothing. I bet my soul that this guy was on a mission. He knew exactly what he was doing and what he was well prepared for. While telling all this, I also started thinking about the logistics of it all. The guy must have had a camp or at least a car hidden somewhere in those woods. You can't sustain yourself out there otherwise. I also got the feeling that he either came upon the cabin during the storm itself, or that he had spotted us in the woods during our hunting. We moved slowly, while also not being shy with waving our lights around. And in total pitch darkness, a proper flashlight would have been easy to spot out there. So he might have tracked us through the woods until we reached the cabin. If anybody has heard about similar things happening in the area of British Columbia, near Vancouver, Please let me know. The mystery has a grip on me for the rest of my life. Sometimes, I even still dream of this raincoat figure creeping closer towards me with each flash of lightning. So this is something that happened to me a couple years back, but it still freaks me out when I think about it. To start with, this was at around midnight, and I was in my room browsing stuff on my phone, or watching YouTube, something like that, when I suddenly hear what sounds like knocking outside my bedroom window, which is on the ground level just for context. I shrug it off at first, thinking that maybe it's a squirrel, or something else, until I heard the same sounds again, which is when I started to become concerned. It was at this point that I left my room, and called my dad to tell him about what was happening. He tried to reassure me it was nothing, and while this was happening, I heard even more knocking come from around the front door. I tried calling out to see if it was one of my siblings, or anything like that, but I didn't get any answers, and at this point, I was starting to really freak out. It was after this that I heard someone at my back door trying to force it open. It was locked, thankfully. My dog finally caught on that something wasn't right and began barking like crazy at the other end of the door, which I think drove off whoever was out there. After this happened, I called my grandpa who lived a block over to come and pick me up, because I was way too scared to be able to stay the night in that house. In retrospect, I should have just called the police, but I wasn't thinking straight. As evidenced by the fact that I was shivering on the couch, holding a kitchen knife, the whole time I waited for my grandfather. I still have no idea who was out there that night. I had taken a walk alone in nature earlier that day, and my only working theory is that someone had followed me home. I later learned that there were drifters living in the woods around that area, which only adds to the thoughts that I originally had. I think the scariest thing about this entire experience is that I would have written it off as an overactive imagination, but for my father coming over the next day and walking around the property only to realize that there were two sets of fresh footprints made in the mud outside of our house. I hadn't been out there, my siblings have small feet, and these footprints were even larger than my dad's work boots, so I truly have no idea where they came from. At this point, I just hope they don't come back. Back when I was much younger, I used to have a friend named Billy and his older brother Jack. There was a neighbor up above on a hill down the road from their house who was normally reclusive. As a friend who just came over every weekend, I wasn't really aware of his existence at first. One night though, I heard creaking on their balcony outside while I was sleeping in the living room. The living room had three large windows facing the balcony next to the street and a door to the left. I was having trouble sleeping, since me and the friends had been playing horror games. I looked out the window and saw the flash of a light coming from the balcony. I understandably flipped the f out, and Billy's parents came running and ran out onto the balcony, where they caught a glimpse of a man sprinting away. We stayed up that night, eating snacks, just kind of vibing, all to cover up the fact that we were scared. The next weekend I was there. A man showed up at the door with a camera, recording us without us knowing for a few moments. 
Billy's dad went out there and started yelling at him as he followed him up the road, and the police were eventually called. I'll admit, Billy's dad didn't handle it the best, but hey, we were all stressed, and it was becoming a lot. The man was later identified as Daniel Vincent Kelly. The next weekend, we saw that very same neighbor down in the far distance, in a large parking lot that we could see nearby a lake. He was riding his bike, shirtless, in circles under a large spotlight, sometimes looking up at the house where we were. We were again horrified, and the man was clearly mentally ill. He vanished from the spotlight, and for the remainder of the night, we were holed up by the windows with weapons in case he tried to record us or break in. The next weekend, we woke up in the night to a loud noise. We found his bike sitting up against the edge of the house on Billy's parents' property. We grabbed weapons and kept an eye out that night and contacted the authorities once more. They found Mr. Kelly and informed us of a YouTube channel that he had. This is the most chilling part to me by far and the part that gives me extreme anxiety at night almost every time I see a window. The most harrowing videos have been deleted due to legal troubles surrounding being non-consensually filmed, although there are several videos that are still live to this day, including this one that I find super off-putting. He walks around their house and claims that a hole in their screen door, which I can never verify existed, has allowed Billy's parents' dog to escape and to attack his dog. He claims that within just a few minutes, my friend's mother replaced the screen on the door and is covering it up, which is obviously false. The deleted videos still make me sick to think about, as there were at least 20 videos of him secretly recording us, some from long before my first encounter with him. One that I remember vividly was in broad daylight. He was just laying down behind a hill, holding his phone up over it and recording us, calling me and my friend disgusting piglets as we played on the porch. At least 10 of the videos featured me and almost all of them featured my friend. Some of them even had Kelly uttering threats, which was absolutely terrifying. Sadly, I wasn't allowed over the following weeks, and I don't know how it really ended. I've never seen Kelly again, and don't know if he ever got arrested or simply moved away. Truth be told, I'm fine with never finding out. It's worth more to me to never see that creepy man ever again. I worked in a small memory care facility about five years ago, and there were only two of us on staff for the evening shifts. We had an agency CNA come in to work with me, and it was our first time working together, as well as meeting. This girl was young, maybe just on the other side of 18, and we began talking while we were working, and she had told me that she needed to go out to her car real quick. She goes and comes back. Then she begins telling me about her boyfriend, how they were arguing over text that day. She told me he was waiting in the car until she got out of work, which was an eight-hour shift. Alarms were going off, and I was thinking to myself how weird it was, and I was going to go outside and tell him to leave. But a small voice inside my head told me not to, and I listened. Our shift goes on, and we were continuing to talk, and she began to tell me how her mom didn't want her to hang out with her boyfriend anymore due to a situation that had just happened. Backstory. They got into an argument in her basement, and he went upstairs and grabbed a knife. Her stepdad caught him and asked the boyfriend what he was going to do with the knife. He said that he was going to hurt himself. She told me the story, and I had this pit in my stomach the size of Texas. I looked at her and said, he wasn't going to hurt himself. He was going to hurt you, and you need to get away from that. At the very end of our shift, we had a long talk, and I explained to her that she's too young to be going through this and that there are plenty of other people out there, and she doesn't need to be involved with somebody like that. I told her, the next time I see you, I don't want it to be on the news, because something horrible happened. She acknowledged what I said with a solemn nod, and before leaving for the evening, she told me that her mom worked for the same agency, and that she would be coming in for the next shift. The young girl went on her way, and her mom came in. I had told her mom that she was still hanging out with this guy, the mom had forbid her from seeing him, and I can see why, so I thought as a mother myself, 
I would want to know if it was my daughter. The mom was really thankful, gave me a big hug, and I went on my way. I started working at this agency myself, and I had seen the young girl's stepsister who also worked at the agency at the facility that I went to. I got really excited to see her stepsister and asked how the young girl was doing since she referred me to the job. A look of cordial professionalism gave way to barren sadness on this woman's face. She let me know that her sister had been murdered by the same boyfriend that we all had warned her to stay away from. This was only a few weeks after I had originally seen her at my job. I feel absolutely sick that this happened to her. And the most messed up part is while I had given her that offhand comment about not wanting to see her on the news, I thought I was exaggerating just to make the point. I had no idea that I was truly telling the future. This really messed me up to the point where I had to go to therapy afterwards. I'm glad that I listened to my gut instinct, which told me not to go out there that night, knowing he could have easily hurt me if I had confronted him in that parking lot that evening. My heart still goes out to this girl's family. She didn't deserve what happened. So this happened to me yesterday, and while it may not be the most terrifying thing, it's absolutely set me on edge. So it was pretty early in the morning, like around 7.30 a.m. Streets were pretty empty. Not really any pedestrians in sight, despite it being a metropolitan city. I had to go into work that morning, and I got up earlier than usual. So I decided to go to this cafe to get my disgusting, heavily modded health drink. The cafe is completely empty, save for me and the lone barista. Well, suddenly, while I'm waiting for my drink at the handoff area, this guy in his 50s walks into the cafe. He doesn't even go up to the register. He just stands two feet away from me, staring. Hasn't ordered a thing, hasn't even looked at the menu, isn't attempting to play it off as if he's standing in line waiting to order. He's just staring right at me. I try to give him the benefit of the doubt and step aside to let him go to the restrooms, maybe? He pulls on the door a few times before returning right to my side to continue staring once more. I'm just so bewildered. I give him this look, I don't know, like I'm shocked or something. I mention to the barista that he's a creepy weirdo, and then he immediately leaves just to sit on one of the outside chairs. I get my drink, go outside to leave for work, and he utters something to me. More so, utters something at me. I don't know what he said, because at this point I'm so creeped out that I'm practically running to my car. I don't know what his problem was, never saw the guy in my life. His facial expression while he was staring wasn't angry or malicious, but it definitely felt predatory as fuck. Something about the intensity of his gaze and how he didn't even attempt to cloak his infatuation. I get a lot of attention on the streets, but this encounter stood out to me for all the wrong reasons. I wish I had heard what he said to me so I could have had context, but the entire experience was chilling, and I couldn't wait to nope the hell out of there. If I'm being honest, it's probably the last time I'll be stopping at that cafe personally. No need to tempt fate, especially when everything off the menu is completely door dashable. I remember this taking place ages ago, so pardon me as I unpack the memories with you. I remember being 12 or 13, definitely in middle school, and having a strange encounter at home. Back then, I didn't really think much of it. Looking back on it now, through adult lenses, it was actually pretty disturbing. So my mom used to go visit her aunt and uncle pretty much every Saturday for years. Sometimes I went with her, sometimes I didn't. They only lived like a half hour drive away. So my mom and grandparents would head out around 11 a.m. after breakfast and get back at about 5 p.m. before the sun would set. One Saturday, I decided I couldn't be bothered to go, so I stayed at home. At about half past three, I went into the kitchen to let the dog out into the garden. Before I opened the back door though, I spotted through the window that our garage door was wide open. The side door to the garage that led down onto the patio in the garden specifically. 
I then spotted that the gate leading into the garden was also wide open. This was odd, as the door and gate were always locked. The gate particularly had a bolt on the inside that you certainly couldn't reach from the outside, so it left me a bit puzzled. Just as I opened the door, I catch sight of a man that I'd never seen before, casually stepping out of the garage, and he begins walking towards the gate. Still standing at the back door, I shouted over, Can I help you with something? The guy looked at me, not particularly surprised or anything, and began to saunter over. He said he was a friend of my parents, and they'd arrange for him to come over and mow the lawn while they were out. I knew that this was a complete lie, for a multitude of reasons. One, my dad was at work, and my mom away for a few hours. They're not going to arrange for some random dude to come over and do the garden. Two, they'd never in their life got someone else to do their gardening. Three, if, for some bizarre reason they had, they'd have told me he was coming. Four, my mom had actually mowed the lawn just a couple of days before. Five, had this been arranged, why would he not know that the lawnmower was in the shed? and not the garage. And finally six, it was late November, early December, so with the sun beginning to set in just about 90 minutes, he didn't give himself a whole lot of time before it got dark, not wanting to mess around with the guy, who had just clearly stated that he knew my parents weren't there. I told him not to worry about the garden, that I'd do it, but he was insistent, saying that it had already been arranged. I told him that he'd still get paid, but again, not to worry about the garden. He said he wasn't getting paid. That freaked me out a bit, because by this point, I had assumed he was just some chancer, trying to con a bit of money out of me. Yeah, your parents want me to mow the lawn, but they haven't paid me yet, sort of thing. I told him there was no good reason for him to do it, then said goodbye, shut, and locked the back door. I watched him through the kitchen window as he headed back into the garage, back out, wandering slowly up to the top of the garden, then back down, just to stand motionless on the patio, staring at the upstairs windows of the house, before finally making his way out the gate. I quickly hurried out and locked the gate, then I had a nose around in the garage, thinking that he had stored something in there maybe. He hadn't taken anything, and it didn't look like he'd left anything either, so I locked the door and went back into the house. I then noticed through the dining room window that he was now stood in front of the garden again, staring at the upstairs windows once more. I sat on the stairs, which are right in the middle of the house, and watched the silhouette of his head pass various windows, stop and stand for a while, and then move on to the next window. Eventually, he rang the front doorbell, which, at this point, I ignored. I went upstairs in the hope of getting a better vantage point, and watched him through various windows as he headed to the back gate, back to the front garden, and back to ringing the doorbell. Back around the front, back around the back, etc., etc. After about ten minutes of him not leaving, I went to call my mom because I was suitably freaked out by this point. But just as I went to get the phone, the guy climbed into a car that I hadn't seen properly that was parked right to the side of my house. He drove off super slowly. I couldn't see him in the car, but I got that sneaking feeling that he was still watching the house as he drove off. Don't ask me why, but I didn't tell either of my parents about this when they got in. When you're 12, you may not make the best decisions. Looking back now, it's so creepy. I first thought that maybe he had been going to break in, but didn't because I was there. Then he was checking the house out so he could break in later. But why do that when he knew someone was inside? Besides, he didn't look like he had the strength to break into a paper bag, never mind a house. He was a scrawny, lanky dude, maybe 60, 65 years old, and seemed pretty slow and just as weak. Plus there were things in the garage he could have easily stolen, but didn't. How did he know my parents weren't in? because he obviously knew that they weren't there. He didn't look the slightest bit shocked or concerned when he saw me. Certainly not like how you'd expect someone to look if they'd been caught in the act. How did he get the gate unlocked? Why was he ringing the doorbell? 
Why was he actively trying to get into the house knowing I was in there? All of these questions I'm left wondering about pretty much all to my lonesome. All because I didn't share that this happened when it did. This seems like the right spot to unpack something horrific from my childhood. Sorry if you find otherwise. When I was around six or seven, we were on vacation at South Padre Island in Texas, on the Port Isabel side. We had stopped at a Dollar General, located at a strip mall, for snacks and beach toys. I remember going around the corner of the shops towards the back. It was only a few seconds, maybe 30, a minute tops. I just wandered off while my family loaded up bags of snacks and drinks. I distinctly remember there was a brown colored van with sliding doors that pulled up right in front of me. The sliding portion opens up and I see at least three figures inside, two of them obviously men, one driving, one opening the sliding door. In English, this is important because my family speaks Spanish, but I spoke English at the time. One of the men, I can't remember which one, said something along the lines of, Hey kid, your mom is looking for you. We can take you to her. Come on, we're going to take you to your family. They're looking for you. A tiny bit of me at first was like, Oh no, maybe my mom is looking for me. Because she was always super extra and would freak out if I wasn't around her for a minute. I believed that she might indeed be looking for me. But then, even as a kid... I was able to put two and two together. My mom doesn't even speak English. These guys came out of nowhere, super quickly. I've only been gone from my family for about a minute, and they came the opposite way from where my family was. Not to mention the creepy van they were in. Yeah, they were trying to kidnap me. So I turned and hightailed it right back to my family. Never saw that brown van again. I told my mom and dad what had happened, but because they couldn't see anybody in the parking lot, certainly no van, I don't think they truly believed what was going on or what was close to happening. While to this day, I remember everything about this situation, if I were to ever bring this up to my parents, they tend to roll their eyes and look at me as if I'm embellishing or telling flat out lies. I know what happened though. I'm glad that even at seven years old, I had the instincts to not fully believe a car full of strangers. Who knows where I'd be now if I didn't. If there's a lesson here, I guess it's to keep your loved ones, especially if they're young, around you always. Like I said, this took place over the span of a single minute. A single minute that could have changed my and my family's lives forever. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university, as I always wanted to come here and get away from my parents as the situation at home had begun to become too toxic for me. In the first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year. I met my boyfriend, who I'm still with, and was just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyway, as the second year came, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations. At least we had our own house now, and we weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as we were living in a small shared flat like in the first year. Note, I had a ground floor room, and my window looked out into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day, as I'm a smoker. There was also a thin wooden gate leading to the other side of the street pretty much where you would leave your trash bins. The gate could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard, but since it was an old gate, we had to attach some strings to it in order to keep it closed for good. We had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five guys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were odd, to say the least. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams, so I went outside with my flatmates, and that's where we saw the guy. 
bruised and bloody, covered in cuts everywhere, and a wound on his head inflicted by the kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do, so we offered him our help. To clean himself up, we gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We then saw the guy who had hurt the roommates being escorted out by the police, into a van, and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about that story. The police didn't really tell us anything. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of odd things, was overly grabby, and kept trying to flirt with me. We noticed when helping him that he smelled like weed, but we didn't really care at the moment. We just wanted to make sure he was okay. Fast forward a little while, I would go to uni, come back home, and see him quite often right outside of his house. I never said a word to him again, but one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and attempted to start up a really odd conversation with me. This was something that I wasn't truly comfortable with, so I didn't respond. He then takes a moment and says, Oh, that's okay. I'll just wait in front of your house then. We can talk later. I was thoroughly creeped out, although I did think he was just joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and began to head back home. As I turned onto the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep, obviously waiting for me. I panicked, went back to the corner store, and called my only guy roommate to ask him to open the door and to get them to go away. But of course, he wasn't home, and no one else was either, so I had to wait it out. After about an hour, they left. I then sprinted back home and locked the front door immediately. Another note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy, and I was pretty successful for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden gate, which is always closed, was open and the strings that we put there to keep it closed had been cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think much of it. I just closed the gate again, put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my roommates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream, yell, and fight in their house. It would wake me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night, but I guess we kind of got used to it after a while. One evening, though, my boyfriend had slept over like he usually did, and he, someone who's a very heavy sleeper and never wakes up due to noises, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering he heard. I was sound asleep, so he very silently woke me up, and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard a loud wooden bang and footsteps next to my window. We both froze, and then we began to hear the door leading to the backyard being shaken softly, as if someone were trying to get inside. Just as soon as it started, it stopped. Silence. Luckily we had the curtains closed, so whoever was outside couldn't see in, but we were ready to get dressed and get the hell out of the room if they came in through the window. Almost on cue, the window begins to rattle. It starts to move, and it's freed from its hinges. We hear a man's voice outside saying something in a different language, although we didn't understand it, and to be honest, we weren't really trying to either. My boyfriend and I shot up out of bed, grabbed our phones, clothes, and ran out of the room, out of the house. I then called all my roommates, told them to lock themselves in their rooms, and then we called the police who luckily arrived in less than five minutes. I don't remember anything after the police came. I guarantee both my boyfriend and I were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, our neighbor. The other fled and was later found a few streets up. The police told us they made entry into their house and found a lot of meth and heroin and that they were carrying massive kitchen knives with them. I was so confused as I'd never done anything to offend any of our neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with God knows what intentions terrorized me and my boyfriend. 
The two guys ended up being arrested, and one of them was put in prison for a couple of years for carrying a weapon with intent to harm. I never heard anything else from the police, and I moved back home a few months later, as I was so scared, and it tormented me for months on end, not knowing what would have happened if my boyfriend didn't wake up. I'm now still coping with it, and finding it really tough to get over, always asking myself, what if? I now very often wake up because of the slightest of noises, and get horrible nightmares because of it. But hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend, and this isn't something that I went through alone. This is a relatively short encounter, but I wanted to share my experience in the event that it helps anybody. I feel like a lot of people get really comfortable in their surroundings, especially when they're off at school. But there's never a time where you should let your guard all the way down. This happened to me early day, pretty much in broad daylight. I entered the student parking lot at my college campus. As I got out of my car, I see a man standing a few cars away. I start walking in the general direction I have to go, and the man says, Hey, remember me? I said, No, I don't. With a big smile, he replies, I remember you from high school. We were in Miss Smith's class together. I never had a Miss Smith in high school, and I damn sure would have remembered this guy if he were in my class, since me and my classmates had been together for the entire four years of high school. So I said, no, sorry, I have to go. Then he asked what high school I went to. Red flag there as well. I make up some high school name because I'm certainly not giving this man any of my information. Again, he says, I swear, I know you. Again, I say, nope, sorry, I don't recognize you. He then asked me for a ride to his class and that it starts at 9.15. My college classes started on the hour. 8 a.m., 9 a.m., etc. All my inner warning lights are going off. I'm getting weirded out by the second. And I say, I'm sorry, I can't. I have to go to class. As I walk away, he says out loud, I guess I can't pull the wool over your eyes. This was an odd and unexpected interaction, and I couldn't help but feel like I dodged a bullet, even in the immediate moments of me walking away. But as the minutes and hours pass, Putting distance in between me and this experience, the memory sort of fades. Until a week later, the college campus newsletter comes out, and it says that a man robbed a student at knife point. The student had given a ride to his assailant, and the student had been asked the exact same questions by the man. Safe to say, he didn't go to high school with any of us. But ultimately, he found somebody that did believe his lie, and paid the price. Luckily, it was with a cell phone, a couple dollars, and a prepaid dining hall card. Much better than the alternative. Stay safe, everybody. This happened to me five years ago, and I'm only telling the story now because I want to warn others. This is quite difficult for me to talk about for reasons that will become clear rather soon. In 2017, I went to a friend's birthday party. It was their 40th, so it was a pretty big deal. I had recently lost my job, and I was struggling with my mental health, but I had a very supportive husband and a very nice family life. Plus, it was a private party. What could go wrong? My husband was supposed to go with me, but our childcare arrangements fell through at the last minute. While I didn't want to go without my husband, he felt that I needed a night out with friends, and the birthday girl kept asking if I was coming. So I went. While it was a private engagement, there were still more than a few dozen people there. All had been invited by the birthday girl. There were a half dozen people that I knew really well, but pretty much everyone else was a stranger. I assumed that the birthday girl had good judgment, and that everyone present was okay. We were all having a great time laughing and dancing. At one point I stepped outside to cool down and smoke a cigarette. A fellow party goer, some guy, ended up joining me. We talked about the birthday girl, how we knew her, and even talked about football. 
Turns out that we were from the same city and were fans of the same team. We returned to the party, and he asked me if I wanted a drink. I said no and raised my glass to show him that I already had one. I then put my drink down and went to dance with the birthday girl. When I returned from the dance floor, I took a big gulp of my drink, and after that, it all gets a little hazy. The rest of this story is pieced together from various sources and photos. There's a photo of me and the male party guest, who I'll refer to as MPG from now on, posing with the venue's door staff. I'm smiling at the camera, my arm around the security man, and MPG next to me, kissing my cheek. I don't remember this photo. There's another one of me and MPG. I'm leaning against him with my eyes closed. I also don't remember this. I woke up the next morning at home, on the sofa, with my husband initially furious about the state that I came home in. Obviously because he didn't know how bad it could have been. Apparently, several of my friends saw MPG trying to guide me into a waiting car and stopped him. When they challenged him about what he was doing, he said that I had agreed to leave with him, but I was incoherent at this point. I also have zero recollection of this happening either. A female friend of mine took me home. I don't remember this, but I know my friend saved me from something horrible that night. Once my husband knew what had happened, he was very supportive and rightfully concerned. The same female friend told my husband how quickly my behavior had changed and just how quickly I had become uncoordinated and incoherent. Like I said, this all took place about five years ago. I saw the birthday girl recently, and she told me that MPG is currently in prison for assaulting his girlfriend in 2020. Please make sure that you're always careful with your drinks. Never leave them unattended. Make sure your friends are looking after you the same way that you would look after them, given the same situation. I believe this all took place in April of 2018. I had gone to Colorado for a concert and was just driving around checking everything out before and after. The day before the concert, I'm driving through the Rockies because I thought it'd be cool, I guess. It was already probably about 9 p.m. I get to a gas station and I see an old lady with a giant suitcase sitting right outside the front doors. I went inside, bought a pack of Swishers, got gas, and just as I was getting ready to leave, that same woman asked me for a ride. Being young and stupid, I said, sure, hop in, ma'am. Before moving an inch, she asked me if I could help her with her giant suitcase. Of course, I didn't want an old woman around the age of 60 trying to lift that heavy thing into my back seat, so I oblige. The ride started off pretty normal at first. We both just talked about life. Well, she did most of the talking, mostly about her kids and family, claimed that she was hitchhiking to Alaska for some insane reason that I can't remember. Anyway, I had a joint that I decided to just give her and let her smoke while we were driving. Not sure why. Maybe to get her to shut up a little bit? Eventually, she asked if I want to try her weed, but keeps mentioning how it tastes funny, which was a red flag in my mind so I politely said no. Then she started getting weird, talking about homeless camps where people smoke meth. Then I actually got a good look at her. Where I originally thought she was 60, I can now see that she's no older than 40 or 45, showing real signs of being a tweaker that life had beaten up along the way. And at this point, both the conversation and the ride itself began to devolve. She starts pointing out rest stop signs or whatever which were like a hundred miles out from, and was trying to convince me to go to one with her. She kept saying, I don't have any money, but some people will do certain favors for you if you give them a ride. Would you be into that? At this point, I'm actually driving like a maniac in the middle of a pretty bad snowstorm in hopes that I'm more visible and noticeable to people if anything were to happen. I was actually pretty terrified. Having a stranger in the passenger seat of my car propositioning me in all sorts of weird manners. After moving through the odd conversation and politely refusing all her sexual and drug-related advances, we finally get to a town on the opposite side of the Rockies from Denver. 
I pull up to another gas station and say, Okay, I gotta get back to Denver and get some rest. I'm dropping you off here. All she said was, You're a very smart young man. And I helped her unload the suitcase that I originally threw into the back seat and pulled off thanking God I was still breathing. As I exit the parking lot, I see that she's positioned herself by the front doors of the gas station, looking for her next ride, in the event that she finds someone else willing to give her one. I'm not sure if it was my paranoia, or simply realizing the gravity of the situation that I had placed myself in. If any of my actions are questioned, just know that I question them myself every day. This was at a time in my life when I was particularly lost and not in a good mental state at all. I definitely shouldn't have been roaming around Colorado by myself. I know just how incredibly lucky I am. To the woman who was hitchhiking from Colorado to Alaska in 2018, I pray that you made it there. But even more, I pray that anybody that helped you also made it home that night. Before I begin, this encounter happened about 10 years ago, when I was 22 years old, and I'm well aware that this was a very poor judgment call on my part. My parents always taught me to help someone in need, just not necessarily to the extent that I allowed. Up until this point, I didn't have much of a reason not to trust people, although not everyone always has good intentions. I've also had an unreasonably difficult time saying no to people throughout my entire life and have since had the help of a therapist to be better about that. I've only told this story to a handful of people because I'm truly ashamed of my actions and potentially putting my daughter's life in danger. I was on my way to an event of some kind when my daughter was three years old. I remember forgetting something at home for the event that I just couldn't show up without. We had just pulled off, so I was close enough to home that I decided to turn around and head back. As I was pulling into the parking lot of my apartment complex, a woman was walking kind of in the middle of the driving area and began to wave me down. I pulled up near to the woman and rolled down my window about a third of the way. She started to give me the story about how she works at the nearby nursing home and she had run out of gas on her way to the gas station and was asking for directions to get there. I didn't think much of the fact that she was roaming around in my apartment complex because it was pretty common for people to cut through as it sat between two main roads and avoided traffic lights. I gave her directions for a five minute walk to the gas station, but she mentioned that she was pregnant and she wasn't feeling well. I tried telling her that I was in a hurry and assured her it was a very quick walk, but she begged for me to take her. At this point, she noticed my daughter was in the back seat and I quickly pick up on the look of surprise on her face that I didn't think much of at the time and she began talking to my daughter and made her laugh. She turned back to me and asked one last time if I could just drive her to the gas station. At this point, I just gave in. I let her in my car and she almost immediately asked if I have any money she can use. My heart sank at that point, realizing she was probably lying and just wanted to lie her way into some cash. I was honest with her and told her that I was broke and didn't carry any cash on me anyway. She pointed out another resident in the complex and asked me to drive her to them. In my mind, there was still a slight possibility that she needed gas, just didn't have the funds for it. So I drove her to the other person and she rolled down my window asking for money. They said no and she pointed out another person. At this time, I told her I really had to be somewhere and that I couldn't keep helping her. I drove her closer to the other person, but stopped far enough away that she would have to get out of my car to talk to them, which thankfully, she did. Once she hopped out of my car, I sped off and drove to my destination, forgetting all about whatever it was that I forgot at home. I told my mother about this story, and a week later, she sent me a clip from the local news. The news mentioned a woman who would approach people asking for a simple favor, which led her to asking them for money. If these people said no, she pulled out a syringe or needle of some kind and would threaten to stab them with it. She did end up stabbing somebody on one occasion. I look at the image of the person in the clipping and I instantly recognize that this is the woman that was in my car. 
I know these types of people don't have much of a conscience, but I truly believe that the fact my daughter was in the car is what kept that woman from stabbing me that day. It's a very cold world out there, and sometimes the reward for helping somebody may just mean a quick jab to the neck. Be safe out there, everybody.